among esotericists and intelligence agencies just caused earthquake. Um, uh, it, 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 because when you decipher the cross of Hende, you realize it's telling you that there's this 400 year cycle where the sun resets and it blasts the crap out of the earth. And, you know, whatever side is facing the earth at the time that the coronal mass ejection hits, causing plasma storms of immense variety, which uh, not just vitrify everything, but actually cause genetic changes in humans, animals. And uh, it's the single most important event that happens to us on a regular basis. And the cross of Hende proves because it was built around 400 years ago, that there was a secret society active at that time that understood this incredible astronomical knowledge. And of course, then that research on the Cross of Hende led me to the Denver airport um, in 1994. I walked through the Denver airport. Have you heard of the money funders dirty secret called shrinkflation? Hello. It's like stinkflation, but it's inflation by stealth. It's where you get less and less product for your buck. But the Fed claims inflation's not the problem. Noble Gold solves this problem. You know, with a precious metal IRA, you can hedge growing prices and retire worry free. How would you like that? You keep up with the Fed's inflation, and this month, Noble Gold has given away a free five ounce pure silver America the Beautiful bullion coin with every single eligible IRA or 401k rollover. Learn more about the services offered at noblegoldinvestments.com and call 1-877-646-5347 today. We're going live right now. So Jay, it is awesome to speak with you. Thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to spend it here with us. You are in a beautiful location. Absolutely love Crestone and the energy out there is electric. How the heck are you, man? I'm really good. Uh, we have a kind of a weird crisis here locally. It's kind of a macrocosm of what's going on in the world and that our uh, local commissioners uh, passed draconian laws here last week that basically can confiscate all of our property. And right now, as you speak, there's a giant um, uh, meeting at the uh, count county courthouse with hundreds of people. I'm getting pictures of it on my phone, uh, including my wife is there, and uh, it's full scale rebellion, dude. What's go What's going on? Well, um, they passed this law. They didn't tell us. The Gateway pundit put the story out on Saturday that Sawatch County in Colorado had passed this incredible draconian law. You have to understand that we are the least jabbered place in America, right? And we're completely rebellious here. We're all libertarians and uh, hippies and rednecks. And, and you know, we just, we, I was at a meeting last night, man, it was ferocious. So uh, we're a macrocosm. The thing is, is that, you know, we're less than one third, you know, with the thing. And so they know that we're sticking out like a sore thumb. We're so, and so now they've targeted us. And, you know, they're, they're going to do a problem reaction solution thing. And we have to be very wary and heady about where we're heading here. And so, uh, you know, I'll periodically let everybody know what's going on uh, here. But it is a macrocosm what's going on. The law is absolutely atrocious. Can, can, can you explain it to us? Yeah, it regulates. It says in an event of an emergency, which is never defined, or a disaster, which is never defined, they can confiscate your property, break into your house without warrant, take your money. Uh, regulate alcohol, uh, marijuana, tobacco, and, and ammunition sales. Um, it is like uh, the most, it, even the one of the county commissioners that voted for it, who's just a hippie organic farmer here in Crestone, stunned that he voted for it. He said he, that he was told to vote for it or else. In other words, it came down from above, from the state, from the state. So we're a microcosm of what's going to happen in Colorado over and, and there were the test case. And uh, so we'll see where this goes, but it's, it's really serious. It's really serious to the point of where I've seen people with many years of experience gasping at, at the, at the law when they read it. And we passed it out at the meeting last night in Crestone and um we, you know, we're, we're fighting against it. And uh, I'm actually glad I'm not there because I think that I, I l should let other people who are not as conspicuous as me speak because like my wife. So, you know, I'm kind of glad I'm here and not there right now. 
because I may say something that I regret later. And uh, um, so it, it's serious. There's even part of the law says that you can be arrested for being against the law. So, yeah. the, Jay, this reminds me of a law that Pat, that actually the Obama administration had uh, did, done an executive order on yes. years ago. The um, yeah. and they when they they originally passed it, it was called the Peacetime Martial yes. Law Bill. Peacetime yep. Martial Law Bill, and they changed the name like three days later because people are like, "What the? F oh no! Peacetime Martial Law? What are you talking about?" And that they're yep. saying they could take your house, they could take your business, they could take over all of your infrastructure in the case of an emergency. So what are they going to use now as an emergency? The Cervezos demons. Uh, yeah, and that's the thing is that it's exactly what you're saying. In fact, it is the enactment of that law in, into, physical, into physical reality. That's what this is. And we're the first county uh, in the country to get it. And, you know, it's not for any reason other than the fact that we're probably the most rebellious place around nothing but free spirits here and um and that was on full display by the way last night as one person spoke after another and they knew everything they were completely awake 100 percent wide awake they probably all watch this show and uh you know and it was like amazing i would you know oh my god am i gonna have to come to this meeting and wake everybody up but i didn't have to do anything they were all ready they knew the score. They knew what was happening. And uh, it was a breath of fresh air. So the, in some ways, they picked the wrong key to start this out at because this this place is so rebellious that I don't even know what's going on across the county uh, with all these people. But I know there's hundreds of them right now in the, in the county courthouse. And, uh, you know, we've all been instructed, you know, to be calm and cool, not to yell or scream. I hope that's what's going on over there. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, literally the law says that if you rebel against the law, you can be arrested. So, uh, and it's passed. I mean, it's, it's law. It's not like, it's not like for debate. So, I mean, it passed. That, it passed. What are people so doing that? What, what, are they just protesting now? Like, what do you do now that it's passed? Well, right now, we're, uh, I'm telling everyone it's rescind and recall. So they force them to rescind the plan, and then we do a special election, recall them, send a message to everybody in the planet that this is what happens in Colorado when you try to do this stuff. You lose your job. And, uh, and, and, and it's not going to be that hard because they were elected with like 500 votes. Remember, got to remember, there's only 6,500 6, people in our county. We're the size of Delaware. Um, we uh, have uh, three policemen, three, three sheriffs. And uh, um, it's just like a lot like the Wild West here. I mean, you know, you're kind of on your own. And um, so that creates this kind of hardy individualism just living here. And uh, they don't, I, I, I can't, I know for a fact that this was handed to them. They did not write it. It's a 30 page law. It's super draconian. And it was handed to them by the state. I know it. They, the, the supervisors have, have said it. The, I mean, the commissioners have said it. So we know that this is coming to Pagosa and coming to, every county in the state and uh, we're just because we're poor remember our, our, our medium income in our county is thirteen thousand dollars think about that our median income is thirteen thousand dollars that's a, a little over a thousand dollars a month that people are living on here in our county and so uh it's a perfect case because we really can't afford to fight it I mean, we are, and we have attorneys coming forward who are just doing a pro bono, but you know, they did they didn't pick a wealthy county where the people would go get outraged and hire constitutional attorneys, and you know, we can't afford that. So we're only looking for if anybody can help us. By the way, we'd love to have help. Uh, anybody, any attorneys out there that understand the Constitution would love to you know help us. You know, we realize that it's going to the way that this whole thing work is working out is we can't it's going to be very difficult because it's already law to get rid of it. That's why it's so pernicious. And they didn't really tell anybody that they were passing it. One of the commissioners said that he didn't even read it, that he was told that if he doesn't sign it, he's in big trouble. So he signed it. So that's what's going on. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a crazy, strange thing to be involved in.
This sounds like the great reset that they're pushing, Jay. Yeah, like yesterday on the internet, you know, they reset everything. I had to uh, re re sign in on my YouTube last night, um, which I have not done in three years or four years, but they made me sign in. Uh, I had to sign in to Facebook. I had to sign in to Instagram. I had to, I had to re sign in to everything. And I noticed a lack of activity, if you know what I mean. And uh, on, on all my, all my stuff uh, this, from this morning, I've noticed that there's a giant lack of activity. So I think that yesterday was some kind of um, internet reset of some kind. I don't know what, well, maybe new algorithms were put in or something. Do you, the day before Facebook had that major outage, yep. there was yep. the 60 minutes, a uh, bunch of, you know, the main, even the main streams talking about how Facebook was putting profits before safety, but they were, they were also downplaying it because they were bringing up specific dates. So they're like, yes, they've been bad. We're going to bitch slap them a couple of times on the back and let them go. Yeah. You know, they're not, I mean, what are they doing? Probably should uh, uh, leave all of that behind and start fresh because it is uh, not going to help to keep rehashing what's been going on here. Uh, we have to find new and clever ways to do our opposition. And, you know, it, 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 we're all, we all have power. We all have a lot of power, actually. And if we just start thinking about ways that we can slow down this coming chaos, that's, that is, apparently there's all been there's you know i don't know i don't know what to do you know kind of a little bit fatigued by this whole thing and i think that's part of the plan is to fatigue us out so that we're like exhausted and 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 so i you know i don't know what's going to happen i i i'm optimistic you know places like crestone and 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 other rural places are are doing really well and uh, we don't want it to uh oh you know, the number one thing that i want to say about that law is it, 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 there's no doubt about it is that underneath the surface of this law is to steal all our water. There's no doubt there over and over. They repeat that they want the water that they have control over our water. And you saw my place. I need, I have a garden and um, you know, and are they going to come here and tell me I can't water my plants or my animals? And, you know, is that what's going to happen here? Cause it certainly looks like it in the law. And we know Denver wants everybody's water. So, um, you know, for their water parks and their golf courses and, you know, their mansions. So we have to like, uh, we have to be wary of that one too, because uh, the whole state is really designed about, the entire state of Colorado is designed as a water feeding into the front range. And, and that's why any talk of like succeeding from the state or joining Utah or something like that, they'll never happen. That will never happen. So um, it's the water that is really the issue here and nothing else. And it's fine that Denver wants, needs water, but Denver won't even do anything to conserve water. You know, they don't limit, you know, how many gallons of water a household could use a day. They don't, uh, uh, they don't tell the golf courses that let the grass go brown. They don't tell the water parks to shut down and, uh, you know, so they're not doing anything to, to, to protect it. All they're doing is trying to take the people in the rural areas and, and, and take their water. And so they can't have any. And, you know, that's really what's going on. It's kind of a shocking series of events. Jeez. You know, I remember talking to Christopher O'Brien and you and several people about the water supplies out there. And then Christopher was telling me that he met with Rockefeller in Crestone. And then yeah. I find out Ted Turner has hundreds of thousands of acres outside of Crestone. So there's some yeah. big freaking money out there, man. You've got like the super elite, crazy rich. And then you got some people that are doing, you know, well for themselves, very well for themselves. But then you've got a lot of people that are just, you know, they're living in tents, man. And they're doing it. They they're are. making it happen. They are. And uh, yeah, you're right. A lot of little people really don't know, but the person that, Marie Strong, David Rockefeller's best friend, he bought this place, okay, in the, in, in the uh, early 80s. He bought all the land here, and he bought it from Adman Khashoggi, the Saudi Arabian arms dealer, 
<laughs> yeah, he owned it, and then he sold it to Marie Strong, and now and now it's like it's in a consortium, and no no rich people. But you're right. I've heard that Dick Cheney has land here. I've heard that um, the guy uh, Donald Rumsfeld just died. He had a ranch out here somewhere, and, and it's like yeah there's some weird stuff going on for sure it's like it's some kind of zone for safety in, when the you know what hits the you know what and um that's my feeling in fact I'll, I'll even go one step further i was talking to the um matriarch of our area all right she's an older woman and knows everything very wise Right. And I and I said to her one day, she was at our house for dinner. And I said, Hey, you know, you know, all these houses all out here that nobody's ever at. You know, you drive around and there's never a car going into the driveway. You don't see tracks going in. There's no lights on. You never see anybody. I'm talking like hundreds of these houses are here. Right. And I said, I said, You, you know what I think? And she goes, What? And I go, I think those are the uh, uh, safety houses for rich people. And she looked at me with this look and she went, well, you're a very perceptive person. And I went, whoa, right? So I, I, that's what I think is going on in this area and probably in most of Colorado right now. I would think towns are becoming a refu refuge for, you know, everybody. They're, they're pouring in. I mean, I was in Telluride last week and it was like, wow. It was like being in New York City. I mean it. It was like there was so much traffic and so many people. Everybody was masked up in every store and storefront said, you have to wear a mask to come in here. And and it was like, well, you know, we're at, we're at 9,000 feet, you know, and we're outside. And why do we have to wear a mask? And then I just, you know, said, you know what? I'm out of here. Just I'm out of here. I, I was there like 15. I wanted to eat lunch. Right. And, and I went to the Middle Eastern restaurant that I used to love. And all their ingredients were gone. There was like two things on them. Everything was taped up. Uh, um, and, you know, I was like, what am I doing here? You know, you know, I, I, it's traffic and snarling traffic. And it was just Colorado's filling up really fast. And I've never seen anything like it. And a lot of the East Coasters are moving here. So well, that's going to be interesting. You know? Now, that's another thing too, is we're seeing, I think this all is, is actually connecting to this great reset and I'm, yeah. I'm going to go for the great awakening, Jay. I think that the great awakening is way better. Yeah. And so the mysteries of the great cross of Hende, yeah. this is probably one of the most profound books on a 400 year reset that many people, for whatever reason, a lot of people haven't even heard of this. And this should be on everybody's bookshelf because there's so much information in here and it's so valuable. As a matter of fact, we were talking about this. And when you wrote this shortly after, there were some things that went down behind the scenes for preparation, right? Yep. Tell me, tell me about that. Well, when, I, when the book first came out, I got on um, Art Bell and George Norrie and Jeff France. I got on a bunch of radio shows. I had a publicist. I wasn't really trying to become famous, but somehow I became famous through the process. And um, NASA started calling me a, a fear monger, that the sun was a, a not a highly variable star. It was a steady state star. And I'm like, well, you know, and all this research into the Maunder minimum and the Ice Age was really just not really well known at the time. But I had done the research because of the book. So I knew it. And so I felt like I was like, you know, talking to people that didn't even understand what was going on. And so I got into some serious heated arguments with people at NASA publicly. And then uh, magically right after that, then NASA sends the SOHO satellite up. All of a sudden they're really interested in the sun. They're watching the sun, they're doing, you know, and, 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 and what I believe is that, <clears throat> The, the pedigree of the cross of Hende is, is very important. And that is that the mysterious alchemist Fulcanelli writes a book that's released in 1926 called Mystery of the Cathedrals, in which he claims 
that the cathedrals of Europe were not built by the Catholic Church, but are um, alchemical vessels that are both active as you walk in, they change you because of the way the architecture is designed, uh, where telluric and etheric forces are brought in and concentrated on the floor of a cathedral. You bring in the Gregorian chants and the big organ and, you know, it just makes this heady incense and all that experience. And But also on the walls of the cathedrals are inscribed the secrets of alchemy. So this book comes out and it causes this big sensation and everybody's talking about it. And then it disappears and World War II happens and everybody forgets about it. But right after World War II, the OSS, the precursors to the CIA, begins an intense search for Falconelli in Europe, in France, in particular. Uh, and they're uh, going all through uh, Paris, the left bank and everywhere, asking people, you know, who he is, what he looks like, trying to get sketches of him and everything. And, um, and then... Uh, in 1957, the book is re-released, only now there's a new chapter, and that chapter is the Cyclic Cross of Hende. It's been added, and we know that Fulcanelli's student went to the Pyrenees Mountains in 1953 and met with Fulcanelli, who was still alive and had actually reduced his age. So when he was seen in 1929, the last time he was seen, he was in his early 80s, and then 20 years later, he's in his early 60s, so he's regressing in years. Um, so that's where we believe, I believe, that uh, the chapter came from, from this visit. And so then they reprinted the book, they put the chapter in the book, the chapter um, among esotericists, and intelligence agencies just caused earthquake. Um, uh, it, it, because when you decipher the cross of Hende, you realize it's telling you that there's this 400 year cycle where the sun resets and it blasts the crap out of the earth. And you know whatever side is facing the earth at the time that the coronal mass ejection hits, causing plasma storms of immense variety, which uh, not just vitrify everything, but actually cause genetic changes in humans, animals. And uh, it's the single most important event that happens to us on a regular basis. And the cross of Hende proves, because it was built around 400 years ago, that there was a secret society active at that time that understood this incredible astronomical knowledge. That's why the cross of Hende is so important. It's also why this information is being so suppressed, which is why I'm glad that you're having me on the show, because I, you know, I spent 20 years researching the cross of Hende, and, uh, and nobody asked me anything about it ever. I spent 20 um, months you know, uh, researching Stanley Kubrick, and that's all anybody wants to talk to me about. So um, <clears throat> this cross you know, is super important. And as soon as this chapter comes out, a lot of strange activity happens. Uh, NASA is started. Uh, the deep underground military bases start being dug. Um, th they um, uh, put in all these emergencies. Uh, uh, every, uh, everything is going on. You can see that they're, they realize that they need to create a continuity of government, which I'm for, by the way. I think it's that's great. You know, We want you guys to keep going and keep you know, uh, the, the lights on and everything. Well, we're, we're all for that. I'm not criticizing the fact that they're just, I think that's great. Um, uh, we're not led into these things, and I, you know, I understand. And of course, in that research on the cross of Hende, led me to the Denver airport um, in 1994. I walked through the Denver airport. Tell us about know, that. Yeah, so I was walking through the Denver airport right after it got made, and um, I saw the murals, and I was right in the middle of my research on the cross of Hende, and I was just like. It was like, you know, I've been traveling to Peru and France and, and, uh, and, and, and I was walking through this area and I saw the extinction mural, which has all the animals that are extinct, the dodo bird, and, but it also has a white child, a black child, 
and a Native American woman in a coffin <clears throat> and a whole forest on fire, as if it's predicting that the world's going to be put on fire, making everything go extinct. Uh, and so I, I realized that, um, uh, that the Denver airport may not be what it is. So that I put out a, a call. This is like really early internet so i didn't use the internet i used local newspapers which are now gone and asked for you know if anybody had worked you know as construction on the denver airport you know to contact me and i got contacted by you know, 20 people maybe 15 and i you know i said did you is there anything underground and they said yeah there's a big huge thing underground we went down in service elevators with all our drywall and we would go down and we'd take like five minutes to get down to the bottom and then we had pre uh areas that we could only work and we could never go out of this one area and we do the drywall in this one area and then we leave at night and go right back up and we we're all, kind of didn't even know where we were because we were led down all these labyrinths of hallways and everything and um and then I started thinking, okay, Denver's you know, sort of in the center of the country. You're doing this continuity of government. So everybody can fly to the Denver airport, which is si what, twice the size of Manhattan? Yeah. And uh, fly into the Denver airport. They all have easy access. They go in a train right into the underground. We know they're un underground in Colorado Springs. I mean, they're not lying or saying it. They know. We, we know they can do it. So why aren't all the mountain range in the front range hollowed out? I would say they probably are. And uh, this is where they're going to do their continuity of government. And it's not it's like, it's okay, you know? And Dick Cheney admitted to all this after 9-11 that they have this plan. And, it, you know, it's all been kind of done, you know? It's, it's, we all know this now. So that's, and so, and also, you know, um, so what we, what we have is the physical manifestation of the reaction to the cross of Hende and what it's saying. And, you know, and it's definitely saying that we're due, overdue, right, actually, for some kind of plasma storm. And, um, and they're, they're highly aware of this. And it's, uh, the evidence is everywhere, actually, when you start looking. That's the kind of thing at your work that you're doing. Man, I watched your thing the other day with the, with the, the pictograms and the, and the, and the plasma guy, that, you know, what's his name? I forget what you call him. Squatterman. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's just fascinating work and the interpretations. And you can see that this is what the Native Americans here in the American Southwest, they remember this thing that happened. I don't know if it happened 400 years ago, 800 years ago, 1200. I don't know when it happened. I don't know how long these pictograms can last, you know, under the conditions that are out here in the, in the Southwest. But I'm so happy that they did them. Because it, it really, for researchers like me and you, it's like, yes, this is, this is evidence that this is real, that this, that this really did happen, and that there are human, humans that remember it and put it down, you know, on rocks and, and things. And, and so that is the big story that, you know, they don't want us to actually understand. And it may be what the even what's going on here locally is, is it really about is it's how do we keep people suppressed so that we can do what we need to do. And so we're going to pass these emergency laws and the disaster is going to come. And, uh, and, and so I think that they're all connected is what I think. I think the whole thing is just one big scenario that's been going on now since since the chapter came in 1957. I think that's when everybody got alerted that, you know, Fulconelli doth speak. They, uh, um, they, he had done a series of lectures uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the 20s that were very famous in French esoteric circles. And let's not forget, in, there's a very thin line between intelligence agencies and esoteric circles. They, they blend very easily together. Uh, intelligence agencies use esoteric terms to speak code to each other. It's uh, John D., Queen Elizabeth's uh, astrologer. He's the guy that started all this. 007 was his name because he wore glasses that had a little handle, looked like a seven. So you looked at him, it looked like he had a 007 on his head. And so, um, uh, and so when, and so anything that's 
very highly esoteric is read by the intelligence agencies. And so when, so there's no doubt that they were interested in this reprint of uh, Mystery of the Cathedrals in the, in the 1950s, and they probably chewed it up, passed it around to everybody. Um, we also know <clears throat> that in 19, I believe it was 1939, I believe it was 1939, um, the guy with the funny mustache from Germany, he made a trip across southern France. He conquered France, right? He, he made a trip, a train trip with his uh, German shepherds across southern France. And he stopped at all the interesting esoteric sites in southern France, which are many. Trust me, <laughs> there are many. The Templars and everybody were in this area doing all sorts of stuff. And there's all these incredible esoteric places there all associated with the holy grail and and all these other things the guy with the funny mustache stopped with all of them and he finally ended up in Hende, france which is on the spain border okay and um as soon as his train car opened he dashed down the train he was a very fast walker and with his dogs and he went right up the hill to where the cross of Hende is and he met somebody there we don't know who, but somebody in a prearranged meeting, he met somebody there. And um, my contention has always been that what happened there at that time in, in Germany and Europe was, yeah, a war, a terrible war, and people died and it was awful and, you know, dang it. But underneath it, they were using the war as a research and development operation for esoteric uh, the honor nobby were the name of the group that worked in the uh, ss that went from place to place looking for esoteric knowledge tibet north africa peru um they were everywhere and um they were in a lot of ways ruthless they would land into an area uh, where you know indigenous people were, and they would basically just steal everything and then leave. And um, so uh, I believe that thing that happened in the 1940s in Europe was an occult operation of a giant order in order to prep uh, the elites to get out of Dodge before all of this hits. And uh, it was the very beginning of what I call Project Good or Get Out of Dodge. And so um, this morphed into uh, Operation Paperclip in the United States and uh, continued on and until it became, you know, the Secret Space Program and uh, probably all sorts of black op projects that are going on right now. And... Um, uh, it, it, it all began then, is what I'm saying. It all began in this little, little time period between you know, 1930 and 1960. You know, this is all these operations began, and now they're reaching the culmination. Walter Bosley posits that this what goes back to Napoleon, that Napoleon was actually the guy, the progenitor of this. He calls it, I think, Project X. Like this is a long range project of esoteric technology, um, occult, uh, you know, to um, build new technologies and, but also to, to, to uh, escape. And I think it's very important to understand that they seek to escape. So all of this uh, uh, learning everything that I've done led me eventually to the Vedic texts. And uh, to see if there's anything in the Vedic text that would talk about this and, you know, like completely blown away by because that's all it's talking about is the Brahma at the end of time explodes the world into fire and, and, um, but there's also this part of the text called the Puranas. And in the Puranas, it says that the, the, uh, the gods or the elite realizing that the fires of Brahma were imminent, create giant arcs in the sky and go to a place called Mahar, a planet called Mahar, 
where like they Mars. hide out. Yeah, where they hide out underground until the Earth revives itself after the catastrophe, and and and, and in in the Vedic knowledge, it, uh, this this coronal mass ejection becomes spiritual. And this is really interesting. So what they say is that that everything that dies leaves behind a spirit. Uh, the Egyptians call it the ka. It's a spirit that is a like a ghost of you that stays behind until your bones finally completely deteriorate. Then your ka d- dissipates as you dissipate, as your body dissipates. That's why in India they do um, they cremate because they want it to happen fast. They want to get rid of this thing fast. They don't want to linger. So they do it. Now that may be a, a problem, you know, you, in some ways you want to go slow with it because you're, you're regurgitating what you did in this life and it's helping your other forms of spirit that are going to re-manifest eventually understand the spiritual reality. So I'm not advocating cremation. But anyway, what the, what the Vedic texts say is that in order for the Kali Yuga to end, and the golden age to begin, there has to be this like cleaning of the earth so that all the Ka spirits are not gone. That's the only way that this cleaning can happen. So the Vedic texts have turned this coronal mass ejection disaster that happens into a, a, a almost like a, a, a cremation of, of everything so that we can all start all over again. So that's their point of view, which is really, you know, it's the thing with the Vedic text is they say things that are uh, profound, but they don't put any spin on it. They just tell it to you. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. And, you know, they're not telling you that that there's anything uh, spiritual about it, really. It's really just, oh, you know. The ka has to all be burned away on the earth before we can revive the planet into a new a new oneness, you know. And um, I think that you know there might be some truth in that. You know, we know there's uh, uh, down under the ground, uh, deep under in the forest of Canada, there's two and a half feet of ash um, from twelve thousand years ago. Uh, we know that the world burned like crazy twelve thousand years ago. It ended the Younger Dryas. So, um, Robert Schock, the Boston University uh, geologist who discovered the aging uh, erosion on this Great Sphinx, he wrote a book, uh, Forgotten Civilization, I think it is, in which he says that what happened is that the ever created the Younger Dryas, Graham Hancock thinks that it was a comet that hit, and I think that's right, um, and, and kind of put us in a nuclear winter for 1,200 years um, and killed a lot of animals and people, uh, ended with this coronal mass ejection that I'm talking about that was so big and so huge that it hit the earth and melted, you know, the in Seattle, the ice was 12,000, is that right, 12,000 feet? Yeah, no, 6,000 feet. There were 6,000 feet of ice over the Puget Sound that melted almost instantly. In fact, Puget Sound is the result of this great melting. That's what it was. It was a giant glacier that just melted. And, you know, you think about that. That's not that far north to have that much ice. So um, that's a lot of ice. And that's a lot of water being released. And uh, you know, the sea levels rose 300 feet, and uh, uh, so also the uh, Robert Felix, the guy who writes the books about the Ice Ages, who's now dead, he got a he got the jab, and now he's gone. Um, he um, he uh, he says that these periods that happen, uh, the electromagnetic field completely dissipates. And then we have rapid genetic mutations because of that. We don't have our protective layer anymore. So even the genetics is 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 built around this whole concept of this periodic uh, reset. Injecting people with aliens, dude. Boom, body snatchers. Hello. What could the- be? Huh? Well, I've been told by a guy who's been in Intel for 
over 40 years that they're going to introduce the um, most human looking alien to us very soon here. And he met this alien um, that they're going to introduce to the world. And he said to me that, you know, dude, I've been in combat and I've done all sorts of crazy adrenaline rush things in my life. And he said, and my brain was completely ready to meet this, this dude. But when I met him, my stomach just turned. And I thought, wow, that's pretty heavy. So yeah, I think there could be. In fact, let me let me let me show you something. A friend of mine. Um, yeah, let me let me uh, add a screen share here so you can share the screen. Last year, I did a remote viewing session on Enceladus, and when I remote view, I don't use the military protocols. I just kind of envision something. So I'm not use I'm not right. going in blind. But dude, I envision like these octopus creatures in Enceladus. And like these very highly intelligent octopus beings, and when you see these releases of uh, like when they're venting out all that stuff in the in the crust of Enceladus and it's going out into space, I'm like, that's got to be like some kind of fungus or spores that these ETs can actually like latch onto quantumly, so they can, you know, that's how they're 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 pushing their seed through the cosmos. And dude, hey. what, what I saw on a grand scale was like these little miniature octopus things in the. <gasps> I saw it. Wow. So a friend of mine just the other day took the Latin inscription on the cross of Hende and put it into word puzzle, which is an anagram machine. And I don't know if you can see on my screen or not, but it's just so interesting because she uh, did this. Uh, she took the, the, the phrase on the cross uh, is O Cruxe Ave Pesonica, which means hail the cross our only hope, but also it's an anagram for things that I talk about in the book, but this has nothing to do with anything in my book. So she put it through in medical and science anagram. Uh, first ones are hey. <gasps> exposure, cases, crispin, cancer, cancerous, cures, parasites, covariances, you believe this stuff? Uh, uh, sky and earth is supernova. If you can believe that, one of the um, one of the variances of the Latin inscription on the cross is supernova, aerospace, inner space, um, concave, cavernous, cave, caverns, inner earth. Um, and if you actually look at the um, the sun inscription, because I know you're into this, if you actually look at the sun inscription on the cross one day, and you know about the inner earth. Um, the inner earth uh, knowledge or, or mythologies, you can see that, it, yes, it's an exploding angry sun. Yes, that's what it is. Everybody, but if you look at it with different eyes, it's the earth with the inner sun and there's and the sun rays are actually the tunnel systems which get you from the surface to the inner earth. So it's actually a map of where the tunnel systems are to get entrance into the inner earth. I've never said that publicly before, by the way. Uh, I just know you're into the inner earth and I am too. And um, so I've actually tapped uh, a lot of that already. And um, and you can, yeah, you can probably, if you see it there, just look at the picture of the sun that if you know about your inner earth mythology, that if that, maybe that's not really the sun or maybe it's both because as you know, symbols have hundreds of different meanings, right? So uh, it's one of Widener's uh, laws. If a picture is worth a thousand words, a symbol is worth a thousand pictures. So um, in the science of symbology, you can, you know, you can see many, many things inside one symbol. And um, that's just one of them. Dude, your book is awesome. You've got so many photos in here also. And, and so I wanted to ask you about this um, for, for more than one reason, but you talk about, and what a cool synchronicity when I told you about that experience I had in Paige, and I'm like, you guys are going to think I'm crazy if I tell you what happened. And, I, and, and look, man, it could have, I mean, it could have been obviously something else, but I'm pretty convinced um, that it wasn't. But then I told you about it, and then you showed me, like your, your wife showed me that photo, and I was like, whoa, what a cool matrix synchronicity, man. What yeah, a cool really. matrix synchronicity. So you, yeah. you, write, you write about Isis and Mary the alchemist, the Gnostic yeah. return. Yeah. What does that mean? So um, Isis, uh, uh, the prophetess, was a Egyptian alchemist. 
And she, um, what happened to her was she was real, really, really very beautiful. And one of the angels or gods was super attracted to her. And she's like, you know, flirt with him, but not letting him have anything. And he's getting more and more desperate for, you know, for a little something. And she's like, no, I'm not doing it. No, I know you're a God and I'm just a human, but I'm not going to let you do it. You can't touch me. And finally says, what can I do, you know, to, you know, particularly have sex with you? And she said, well, you have to give me the secret of immortality, the secret of alchemy. And that's the only thing I will let you do. Uh, I will, you can have me if, if you do that. So that's how we discovered the secrets of alchemy. They were given to Isis the prophetess, and uh, then she passed them down uh, through Egyptian lore. And, 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 uh, and then eventually in, um, uh, in Europe, a, a woman named Mary uh, rediscovered the secrets uh, that Isis the prophetess had left. And that's how uh, alchemy uh, became prominent in Europe. And um, uh, it's interesting because they're both women and, um, uh, and you know, you don't usually associate alchemy with women, but yet alchemy came from two women. And uh, I think it's even true in Chinese alchemy it came a woman. So, um, and so, you know, the secret is, um, the secret is how to consume light. How do you consume light until you have the light within you? And then when you have that light within you, you now have, it's not immortality, it's just that you have a, a, the ability to live longer. And the reason being is that the secrets of alchemy are so profound and deep that you need a long time to do it. That's why Falconelli did Falconelli when he achieved um, the uh, lengthened body life. That wasn't what the end game. That was the beginning. Now he had the time to actually do the work that we were required, which takes years and years and years to do. And um, you know, that's that's the secret of alchemy. In in in, in so. You can ask yourself, okay, so how do we can how do we consume light or gold or whatever? So the gold and light and sun and all that are all the same metaphor in alchemy. So some people sun gaze. Um, I do. I, I don't. I don't. Not recommending it. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't. I don't look at the sun. I look off to the side. But you know, I spend 15, 20 minutes every morning when I'm doing my morning hike, making sure that I'm getting as much sun in my eyes as I can. I do it in the morning because that's when it's not so intense. And, you know, I, I, have, I don't have any problem. I, I don't, again, I'm not recommending it to anybody. I'm telling you what I do. Um, I, I eat certain things that are high alkaline um, because that, that also has got a lot of, uh, of alchemical attributes in it. Um, blue green algae is loaded with, in alchemy, there's a thing called the iskaton, and the iskaton is this little particle of light. And um, only people that really know their alchemy know this, and I'm probably going to get in a lot of trouble releasing all this right now. I don't care anymore. Um, and what we know for sure is that blue-green algae contains massive amounts of iskatons. So I highly recommend that you take blue-green algae every day every day don't even not take it even one day and um and then of course there's mistletoe uh, this is probably the greatest secret and so you go and you uh extract mistletoe that grows on oak trees only oak trees are allowed and the oak tree is a incredible plant that nobody really understands and so if you're going through the forest you're hiking if you're a big hiker like i am and you know i, I lived in california I used to hike in the, in the forest and in, in california and in, in a big ponderosa pine forest the ponderosa pine is maybe 120 feet tall right and then the oak tree would only get to maybe 30 feet maybe 40 feet tall 
Yet every time lightning came, it would not hit the ponderosa pines, it would hit the oak trees. So I'd go in the forest and I'd find these oak trees that had actually been exploded outwards, right? You could actually see the whole tree exploded outwards. And I, and I kept finding them and thinking, well, it's so odd. Why is the lightning hitting the oak trees, right? So one day I talked to a forest ranger about it. And I said, what's, what's going on here? And he said, I don't know. He said that you, you would think that they would hit the ponderosa pines, but they're attracted to the oak trees. So that got me, because I remember all the oak tree uh, uh, mentions in all of my alchemy books. So that got me thinking, okay, what is an oak tree? So then I started looking and I realized that, that an oak tree is this incredibly dense crystal, growing crystal. And that's why, you know, Ironside, the boat, remember that the cannonball found, they were made with, with oak, right? With super dense, old growth oak, right? And every day the oak tree sucks up hundreds of gallons of water into its branches and uh, every night. And then in the daytime, it releases them. And the Native Americans do this and they would go when they were, you know, thirsty, they would dig a hole right near an oak tree and then find water. So I realized it's this giant lung bringing water in and out and then in alchemy they tell you to try to find the black water that the black water is a secret one of the secrets of alchemy but one time i was a a, a, a oak tree had branch had fallen and broken from just too much weight uh, at where i lived in california it was a big and ancient oak tree and for the next four days black water poured out of the branch of that tree and I, and I thought, well, I wonder what that black water really is, right? And then I saw the mistletoe, and I realized that it had its, its um, roots into this black water, and it was taking whatever the nutrients are. Remember that alchemy starts with the prima materia, which is um, the black stone. The, the black is what the prima materia is. That's the first thing you have to find. So the mistletoe is taking and refining this black liquid, which is coming up from the ground through the oak tree, breathing every day, and it's concentrating it. And so what I did was I cut the, it says in alchemy that you have to use something gold, a gold blade, and that's because this is inherently electrical nature. That's the other thing I forgot to say is that the um, electrical field around an oak tree is huge. That's why the lightning's attracted to it. Okay, so there's a huge electromagnetic field around an oak tree where the ponderosa pines don't have that. And so the, you use gold and you can't let the mistletoe touch the ground. They specifically say put blankets all around the oak tree, use a ladder, get up there, use a gold knife to cut the oak tree and make sure it never touches the ground, put it in something, carry it back home, make sure you never can cut it up and put it into grain alcohol, high, um, I don't know what you call that stuff. Yeah, grain alcohol and in mason jars. That's what I did. I filled them up, packed them in tight, put them, I did this about you know 10 years ago and I've been taking that uh, every day. And that is, um, that is probably the <clears throat> greatest, easiest thing you can do. And the Pacific Northwest is filled with these oak trees with uh, mistletoe. So if you're ever up there, you know, you just pull over and grab some and take it back with you. Um, I highly recommend that you do that. Uh, it's a sin to cut mistletoe. The, um, uh, all of the esoteric groups uh, going back into the 1700s, I have back here behind me, um, all talk about mistletoe, the power of mistletoe, um, the, the life-giving essence of mistletoe, uh, all associated with the oak tree. Uh, there's even that book, The Golden Bow, Bow by James, I forget his name now. Anyway, he in the 1880s, wrote a whole thick book, this big, only about mistletoe and esotericism and the relationship to it. And, and the golden, uh, also Robert Graves wrote a book, uh, The White Goddess, which is all about how the goddess in Europe was associated with the mistletoe and, um, and, and that we'd lost this tradition. And so th those are the things that, that where the light is imbued, right? And there's others. Um, so this thing is essentially electrical in nature. And so you want to find ways to absorb the electrical energy that's around us, which we call chi or prana. And, um, 
it's also the etheric nature. It's the ether, uh, the, the thing that we're swimming in that nobody, everybody denies in science. Well, alchemy is 100% ether oriented. Uh, we, we believe in uh, making buildings that bring the ether down. That's one of the reasons why my house has so much good energy is because it's designed that way. And we need to rethink how we do, we do our construction and our cities and our build. And we have to understand that absorbing the chi and creating prana spaces is the key to happiness. And one of the reasons that we're so unhappy is because we are, live in places that are unhealthy, essentially. Well, yeah. I mean, look at how many people spend almost all their money to live in a big city. They're spending an hour or two hours in traffic to get to work and then an hour or two to get back from work, you know, dealing with just all that nasty pollution. And then people are emitting more verbal vomit than and the media. It's like you're constantly surrounding yourself in that disharmonious vibe. 440. I was talking about this at Disclosure Con. I said, look, you got six corporations that control over 90% of the media. The majority of what you hear or see on TV is in 440 hertz, which is a disharmonious frequency anyway. Yes. They, don't care. they don't want you to reach your fullest potential because if you did, you wouldn't need them. They want you to feel like you need them. And when I'm saying them, I'm talking about a very select group of people that feel that they are the chosen ones and feel that they're the ones that have the right to control you. Kind of like we're talking about with this book. Very powerful people get together and they say, look, we got 400 years. What are we going to do about it? Yep, that's exactly right. And they know what's happening. And that's it's, it's so to for me to have written this book, you know, it came out in the first one came out in 99 and then the second one 2004 or three um, to be sitting here and watching this happening, the Great Reset and Carl Schwab and and all this stuff happening. I'm like, they know they know what's going on here. They know, and they, and, and they can't be covert about it anymore. So they have to be overt. And so they're showing themselves and we're seeing it and it's jaw dropping and they're, uh, they're not going to end. I mean, I, you know, they're, 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 we're going down some highway and none of us really know where we're going, but they do. And um, I don't know what's going to happen, man. It's, it's it's now that it's hit home locally, I can honestly say I'm getting a little bit worried. Well, yeah, man. I mean, you've got your nest egg out there. You've got, you know, so much energy and time and money put into that location because it's such a beautiful location and safe location. And now you've got the dirty MFers wanting to take that away from you because that they they're scared, dude. They want to get as many resources and much water together so that when things do go bad, they can make it through. And then their generations, they, they want their generations to come back out and repopulate. Well, let's make yeah. sure that if this situation takes place as far as a global reset, that there's enough of people like you, like me, like others that were watching our podcast, that we're not going to let these MFers turn us into machines and robots, and that we are going to be a part of the divine. Because we signed up for this. My friend Rock Estaldo said that the other day. He's like, dude, we signed up for this. I'm like, you know what, bro? You're right. We did. Yeah. So are we going to let them just freaking poison the planet? And then blame us? Or are we going to say, look, no, no, you don't have my permission to, uh, to assimilate me to the board. Yeah, that's exactly how we have to be. And, then, you know, the, I would say that probably the greatest threat to the board is people like us who are taking care of ourselves. We don't really need their, their shopping centers and their grocery stores. And we're doing just fine on our own. Right. And, uh, and I think that's the greatest threat. Otherwise, if they really cared about us, then they would be telling us, hey, you know, you guys grow your own food and and take care of your family and, and all. But they're not. They're not telling us any of that. They're completely ignoring the crisis. Meanwhile, they're prepping. And I really believe that's where those um, shipping containers are that are missing. The 20 percent of them that are gone now. I think those are being used to hoard rich people's stuff. I mean, you know, they, they work really well buried underground, right? I mean, you put, you put one of those shipping containers with three feet of topsoil on it, it'll stay nice and cool in there. You can keep anything in storage for a long, long time, you know? And well, I sorry to interrupt you. I was just gonna say like, we can't blame people that are rich for wanting to secure their families and their, and their, their livelihoods. We're talking folks, we're talking about like those out there that have so much money and so much power and so much control that they're 
clamping down on populations around the world. I mean, there's plenty of millionaires out there that are like, hey, man, we need to protect our family. And they're telling their friends about it and stuff like that. We're, we're, this, so I'm just stopping any troll out there that might want to start talking smack. No, we're talking about people that feel like they're our God and they're not. Schwab is yeah. not my God. He's not my God. He's, I don't know what he is. I mean, he actually, I hate to say this, I'm kind of, but he looks like he's probably fun to party with, man. I mean, look at me. He wears like freaking Klingon clothes and shit. And he's like, you don't know nothing and like it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, dude, have a few drinks with that guy. I would just, you know, I, I would make sure that, um, yeah, I was pouring the drinks. But dude, yeah, I mean, seriously. So like, actually, he's a multi-billionaire and he's telling people that they don't have enough equality. Like, does that make sense, folks? Like, didn't Stalin kill the smart people first? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and the farmers, the uh -huh. kulaks. Yeah, that's the very first people that he were the PhDs and the farmers. And then the farmers, they, they clearly said that the farmers had aggregated too much wealth and that they have too much control over the population because they're growing food. So Stalin uh, immediately got rid of the kulaks and immediately they went into a giant famine immediately and this is how they do it over and over again and i'm you know i don't want that to happen here i don't want uh, the people that are growing food to be put out of business but again these draconian laws pretty much just say that i can't even water my lawn i'm in my garden so it's like okay you know and, and, and in the net sum of course i'm doing much better for the environment by having a garden because i'm not transporting the food i'm not using any pesticides i'm not you know what i mean it's like there's no way that you can say that i'm uh taking advantage of the environment and net net aggregate is better for the environment for people to grow their own stuff locally so i don't know what they're gonna do with that and uh it's, it's, it's amazing to watch. It's amazing to see the every day the screws get tighter and tighter. Have you noticed? And um, now I was uh, in, I was in Northern Arizona a couple of days ago, right? Cause I did the speech at disclosure con and dude, people out there, they know what's up. Like, yeah. the, I, I mean, I was driving past, you know, homesteads, a lot of homesteads out there yeah. and, and people out there are like, come on. Like they're, they're, um, they're ready. <laughs> they seem pretty ready. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to say much more, but out in that area, I noticed like the, the Northern Arizona area, the four corners area, even all the way up into Crestone, like you said, the, the thing that makes Crestone different is you had mentioned it's a very small population, very low income. And there's a few people, super elitist that have so much land out there. And then the water and the location that is a, a I mean, if that does spread like wildfire, there is no way that this country we are in anymore is anywhere close to what it resembled 30 even 20 years ago man yeah i would suggest that everybody contact their local county commissioners and tell them that if you try to pass this law um you're going to be in big trouble because you've got to shop with us you've got to be in the same communities with us that's what i told my wife she's at this meeting right now that's what i told her to say when she has her three minutes right you get up there and say hey listen you know you guys, we know you guys. We see you guys at the store. We see you at the gas station. You know, you have to live with us. You know, I mean, that, that's really important. And I think that we need to do it on a personal level like that. They're doing that in Australia right now. Women are going to the wives of the policemen in their neighborhoods. They're saying, listen, my husband has to go to work. You can't beat him over the head right? And, and, you know, we're your neighbors. And I think that's, that's got to be the tack we take because violence and, and screaming and shouting is just looks like mental illness. And, you know, there's way too much of that in the world right now. So I think it's time for us to show that we're the cooler heads, the ones that are not choosing to be part of the board. We're the cooler heads, not you guys. We're the ones that are not going to hurl insults at you. We're not going to threaten you with violence. We're going to cajole you through friendly conversation. We're going to tell you that we have our own rights. You need to respect our rights. And if we don't want to do something because it's my body, my choice, you need to respect that. And I'll respect your rights, too. So a mutual respect has to happen here. And... Um, and if they don't, well, you know, here's the thing, Rex. The American Revolution had, what, 5% of the population behind it? One-third of this country is refusing 
to join the Borg. That's a lot more than 5%. And so I think that that is worrying them a lot. And I, what I think they're actually worried about more than anything else is uh, what I call uh, euphemistically Paris 1789. That's what I think. I think they're very worried about that. And in the age of internet and everybody knows what everybody looks like, um, it's really hard to get, a, you know, in 1789, you could have put a disguise on, jumped in the carriage and gone out the back door and maybe escaped, you know, to Spain or somewhere. But I don't know. There's nowhere to go anymore. And everybody knows what everybody looks like. And and uh, uh, so I think they're worried about that. And, you know, I'm not advocating it. I'm really actually advocating the opposite. I'm advocating that we, uh, instead of doing a top-down great reset, how about we do a bottoms up reset or great awakening? Like, yeah. The great awakening in which we um, abandon the cities. We create community. We grow our own food. We take care of our children. We play music. We dance and we love each other and we live our life and you leave us alone. And if there's a disaster or an emergency, you we can handle it. We've been handling it for 20,000 years or whatever. We can handle it. I've been in many emergencies. I've been in tornadoes. I've been in floods. I've seen people do amazing things without any government telling them what to do. I've seen people pull trees out of ditches that uh, you know were causing flooding right just taking their pickup truck and putting a chain on it and then doing it no government told the guy to do it he just did it and he stopped the massive flooding that was going on and i so you know we know how to handle it you know i know how to handle it and uh you, you know when there's a fire we all show up right and so that's that's the way that it has to be and we don't want the top down thing because actually it destroys community the best thing that's happened here because of the passing of this law was the meeting that we had last night. The first time our community is actually coming together in a really positive way, and we're going to devise our own plan to take care of disasters here. We don't need their plan, and we're not going to confiscate anybody's property, and we're not going to take anything from anybody. We're going to all just get together and help each other, and I think that's what has to happen. We're going to lose we're also going to have to start um policing our communities we're going to we're going to lose the the funding is going to eventually dry up and and your, your sheriffs are not going to be able to do the things that they're they can do now uh, gas prices are rising everything is going up and um so we have to um uh we have to become more localized and we have to do our own policing and we don't we're not vigilante style but i mean you know when you see something going on you need to do something about it, you know, especially if it's harmful to the community and, and not in a violent way, but in a community oriented way. So we need to create all these new things and we're going to need to we're going to need to grow food and pass it around to our neighbors because everybody's going to be starving and hurting here in the near future. And uh, we need to rethink everything we're doing real fast. Well, and also education is so important. And, and we look at um, what has happened over the past 20 years, right? You talk to these other, these younger generations and th the majority I've noticed seem to be very compartmentalized, unfortunately. And so education is so key. We have to figure out a way to create a new school system, like true education where kids are learning to think. They're not learning to regurgitate. Right. Because that's not what you're like. Well, I repeat this. I read this. I repeat, read, repeat. That's great. I mean, that's awesome. But computers can do that, too. So why not learn how to give these new generations the tools that they need to really be like super human? And because it's so much in the mind, man, they, they control our minds and that controls our attitudes and that controls our realities because you've got a box and a box and a box and a box. So we open up the box. We, we, um, and I think that also at a very young age, that's probably when, you know, I mean, if you're trained a certain way to think a certain way or to be a certain way at a young age, that's going to have a much bigger impact than when you learn it at 50 or 60 or 30 or 40, whatever, just because, you know, I mean, it's like everything is new and exciting and da, 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 da. So, but they knew that 
And what did they do? They took over the school system. They indoctrinated the whole world, man. Almost. There's little slivers of us out there that know what's going on. You know, something weird, Jay, is I knew about all this stuff 30 years ago, dude. Before the internet, nobody ever told me. I just knew it. And I was like, I was speaking it. People would, I would literally have people just like sit there and listen to me because yeah. stuff would like flow out of my, I'm like, how, how do I know this shit? I don't know. And I wonder, man. Like what we're doing, you and I right now, are we reliving our past lives in a way of like, okay, we're going to the same places. We're uncovering these, like all this Knights Templar stuff that I've been uncovering, these petroglyphs and, and the small people. We were just talking about that. And it's like, wait a second, man. We're going back to maybe where we were in a past life and we're bringing it back to life. Yeah, I think so, that's why they call it research, right? Yeah. It's something that we're looking back at. We've already done. And uh, yeah, and you know, like the uh, explosion in the exploration of our reality is what we're really talking about. And uh, the acceptance of ideas that, yeah, I'm like you, man, 30 years ago, I was, you know, I believed in little people and, you know, I'd seen the Sasquatch and, you know, and I, and I believed all this stuff and I, I, I couldn't quite understand why no one else believed it or why it seemed so unbelievable. And now I think everybody's starting to catch up to it and that's great. And uh, um, I remember um, um, Zbigniew Brzezinski right before he died complaining about the Great Awakening. I don't remember that YouTube. It's like, they are waking up too fast. <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah, they are. And uh, and there's no no putting the genie back. Uh, they've tried to in the last two years with the internet, but it's not working. Um, just we just find new ways to go around it, and so there's nothing they can do to stop it. So uh, and I think they're trying one more time to do something, but I don't know. But you know, what we have to do is we have to oppose them peacefully and throw cogs in the wheels when you can to jam up the thing you know there's millions of things you can do cliff high has a show on bit shoot which is really good because he's always kind of teaching you how to like you know jam the system and i think that's kind of what we have to do we can do that by the way it's not that hard uh, there are a whole bunch of things that if you just start thinking about it you could do that would slow everything down and make everything go slower because that's what we need now we need time they're moving really fast and um, uh, so I don't know. And then, the, uh, you know, it, it, everything is happening so fast that, you know, shows like yours become the only thing that you can watch just because it's like, you know, the news is useless. Um, just like maybe five or six shows on YouTube that I watch and I just watch those and that's it. And that's all I watch, you know, Ice Age Farmer, David Dubine, your show. Oppenheimer Ranch, you know, it's like not very many. And Your show's great. I, I mean, you got some great guests and you got a great mindset too. Um, Reality Check, folks, for those of you, if you didn't know, um, Jay has an awesome YouTube channel. It's called Reality Check. And dude, um, I am so impressed with like your vibe, just your energy. Every time you have a guest on, you just got this really positive vibe that I'm like, yeah, man, I could jive with that. Yeah, yeah, I, I try to, that's what I try to do, like you do, I try to try to put the positive spin on what's happening here, because it's just, you know, it's easy to get negative, but, um, excuse me here, but, um, you know, creating a sacred space in your house, so many positive things that you can do, and I think that I'm using that show to try to help people realize that although we're living in darkness, you can, in your own private space, create a place of light and uh and healing and i think in these times that that becomes more important than ever right on man and, and i wanted to show off your book one more time here the mysteries of the great cross of hende alchemy and the end of time and share with us another excerpt out of this before we finish up this awesome podcast it's been rad man well let's see okay so um i uh Fulcanelli tells us that the Latin inscription is telling us of a place of refuge from this coming disaster. So this is like 1987, I read this. So I wrote down the inscription, I carried it around with me, this 
free computer internet and all that. And I would just look at it when I was meditating or waiting for someone. I pull out my wallet and I just look at the inscription. And one day I was waiting for someone to get, a, get off the bus or something in my car. And I pulled out and looked at it and I looked and all of a sudden the inscription kind of, you know, like they do in movies, it kind of started moving around. And all of a sudden I read it and it said Inca Cave, Cusco, Peru. And exactly the letters that were in the inscription, and that's what it said. And I was like, whoa, Inca Cave, Cusco, Peru, the place of refuge. So um, I went to a rich person that I, was a patron of mine, and I said, hey, uh, can you fly me to Peru? I got to go to Peru. And he goes, okay. So I go to Peru, and this is in the 90s, early 90s, and I find these cave systems everywhere right giant ones and tunnel systems that are going for great distances and and i have a guide he's showing me all these tunnel systems and everything and i'm like blown away so i write my first book in 1999 and i, and I mention all this in the book i go to peru and i find these tunnel systems and i'm thinking here we are twelve thousand feet up so you wouldn't get any flooding you got the ceiling of the thing to protect you from the coronal mass ejection of course this is where you would go right and the native Amer uh, incan mythology says that Veracoca went into a cave and and the sun exploded and he waited it out and then he came out and started the inca kingdom right so i write the book and then i decide i want to go back to peru so in 19, so two or three years after the book comes out, I go back to Peru. Going to ex really explore these caves this time. I've got my spelunking equipment. I've got a spelunker going with me. I've got lights. I've got everything, cables, and I've got the whole thing. I get there, and there's armed guards now in front of every cave entrance everywhere, and they're still there to this day. So that's my uh, final story on the Cross of Hende whoa yeah man that's wild yeah dude thank you for sharing that man that's an awesome te awesome testimony I mean, <laughs> you're so lucky you got to see that before it went yeah, down. yeah now no one can see it it's sad i think i blew it i think when i put the book out, I, I told everybody then all these tourists started flying down there and go, try, going spelunking and then they go stop it they'll find the entrance yeah. you know because that's where the entrance is one of the entrances is in peru well, dude. Okay. And then finishing. So a couple of days ago, we're out at this location where um, sacred, sacred ground, like we're talking to the Zuni people. This is like the temple Mount to the Jewish people. And, and um, we were, did I say that right? Did I use the terminology? Right. I hope so. Anyway, very sacred yeah. ground. And yeah, we find, we find well, yeah, yeah. Well, guess what you didn't see. I haven't uploaded it yet. We found two giant stone rocks that had um, carvings from 1900. The first one said, the door, September 11th, 1900. Wow. And so I'm with, I'm with my friend Scott, and he's with his wife and his wife's sister. And Scott's six foot six, weighs 350 pounds. He's He's Anunnaki, dude. He's a big boy. Maybe not Anunnaki, but he, I'm just playing. But he's a big boy. So um, we see this massive stone bowler, or, the, or not a bowler, just a stone. Like it's it's almost like a like a door, right? But it's it's this freaking thick, and the thing probably weighs at least two or three thousand pounds. So we were going to move it, but we just knew we had no chance to move it. And next to this rock, and this is where all the the the, the native Zuni stuff is, where they think these cosmic eggs came down. And one of the cosmic eggs was given to the Navajo and one was given to the Hopi. And the pretty egg turned out to be the crow and the ugly egg turned out to be the parrot. So, um, but anyway, we, and, and you can see how they're depicting it in these petroglyphs. Then we find the door, September 11th of all dates, September 11th, 1900. And then next to this up, next to it is another rock that, you know, kind of looks like a carve it could be a massive door but it, it said it's got this latin inscription on it it says liberato something something and i was i was going to pull it up on the computer but it's not uploaded yet so maybe i could just show it on the on the screen and you could barely even see the writing on it but with the camera it actually made it pop out more um so dude this this uh what the heck huh you think it was the templars i do i think it, but it was yeah, from the 1800 templars all over the Templars were all over New Mexico and Arizona. Um, 
that came through with the Spanish in the 1500s. Okay. Um, see, so this was from 1900. So it was quite a bit, but there was another one next to it that said Liberato. I'm, I got to find this here, man. This is going to blow your mind. Um, dang, where, dang it. Yeah, there's all this um, Templar stuff in the superstitious mountains in Arizona. Oh, yeah. This is all like the Templars were there mining gold, I guess. Mm -hmm. We found some stuff out there um, in Tucson of what looked like the Knights Templar crosses. Um, and, yep. and when you see these crosses, sometimes you'll also find buried treasure in, the, in a very similar location. I'll, I'll send you the I'll send you the footage because I'm not. Um, oh, this is weird, too, man. We found like this. This one spot where you see that that's all that's like crystallization. Oh yeah. And it looked like a bunch of veins. Yeah. And this is where we found that door. It said the door, and then we found that other rock that said liberato something something in Latin that I that I couldn't quite make out. That's um, actually um, that's actually evidence for gold, by the way. I knew it. I knew it. Yeah. There's got to be a ton of gold out there, man. There is. That's evidence. That's what gold. That's what gold miners are looking for. Those veins like that. Then they know that right below there, there's gold. Yep. That's okay. So they were probably from 1900. They were out there looking for gold. They found so, right. that. They put on that rocks. But then where'd they go after that? Well, the thing is, is that everybody's looking for the gold miners, and they and they're trying to find where their stash is. And so a lot of gold miners get killed. I mean, you know. It happens all the time. You go to the town, you hand in your gold to get cash. Everybody in town starts talking about you. You're spending money at the saloon and, you know, and everybody knows it and you're buying drinks for everybody. And then you still go back to your mind and you get followed and uh, it happens all the time. Yeah, I, I'm really interested in all of this. It's like the Southwestern lore of the miners and how they, I, I think you probably found a mine is what I think is what you did. You found a mine. And, uh, uh, and whoever it was abandoned it for whatever reason. But even here in the San Cristo de Cristo mountains, there's all these abandoned mines, not just the big ones, but there's like many little small mines that have been abandoned. And uh, who knows how much gold they've taken out of these hills, you know? Remember to check out leakproject.com every single day because we do live shows daily, sometimes more than one show unedited uncensored free you can ask the guest and myself questions we have some amazing people in the chat they're getting busier and more people are showing up every single day also check out our archives over 4,000 podcasts and we get into exclusive content and exclusive discussions on almost all of our interviews these days and we upload as much as we can on our other platforms that are available so if you want to listen to everything, you need to go to leakproject.com. Yeah, man. Wow. Life is exciting. Let's keep it, it real is. and let's keep it fun. And let's keep, keep being the change you want to see, will you, Jay? You bet, man. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Uh, let's do this again sooner than later. You bet. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us. Make sure to hit the bell and go over and check out Reality Check on Jay's YouTube channel. And... Be the change you want to see, everybody. Love you.